A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Nineteen eighty started out as a great year for actress Teresa Saldana. She co-starred in two of the year's biggest films, the crime drama Defiance and Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. Her career was taking off, and people were beginning to take notice of the young actress. Unfortunately, one of those people was a Scottish drifter named Arthur Jackson. He became so obsessed with Teresa that he hired a private investigator to obtain her home address. But the investigator was only able to get Teresa's mother's unpublished phone number. Arthur then called Teresa's mother, pretending to be Scorsese's assistant, and claimed he needed her daughter's home address to send her a script. Unfortunately, thinking she was being helpful, her mother complied. Teresa left her home in West Hollywood on March 15, 1982. Unbeknownst to her, Arthur Jackson was waiting for her. In broad daylight, he stabbed her 10 times before a delivery man came to her rescue. Luckily, she survived. The harrowing attack was all over the news. It was a cautionary tale, but her story felt like an isolated, albeit tragic, occurrence at the time. For a young man named Robert Bardo, the Teresa Saldana story served as an education of sorts. He learned that it was possible to track down his celebrity crush. And he did so by hiring a private investigator to find her. In 1989, seven years after the attack on Teresa Saldana, Robert Bardo used those lessons to stalk a young actress named Rebecca Schaefer and kill her. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is The Murder of Rebecca Schaefer. In 1986, 16-year-old Robert Bardo was watching TV when a promo came on for the TV show My Sister Sam. The premise revolved around a photographer whose teenage sister comes to live with her after their parents died. Robert was mesmerized by the woman who portrayed the teenage sister, a young actress named Rebecca Schaefer. He saw in her everything that made him feel safe and heard. Two things he did not get from the people surrounding him, including his own family. Rebecca's character exuded warmth and wholesomeness, two qualities that Robert said he appreciated in a woman. So Robert began to write letters to Rebecca. He told her he was a sensitive guy and that he understood her. He knew if he could get just one letter to her, 
she would fall in love with him. But he wrote more than one. In fact, he wrote over 40. And finally, he received a reply. Against the advice of others, Rebecca answered her fan mail personally. When she replied back to Robert, she sent a picture and told him that his letter was the, quote, most beautiful she'd ever received. She signed the response with love from Rebecca. This was her standard sign-off to fans, but Robert Bardo believed it was Rebecca's special message to him. The day he received it, he wrote in his journal, quote, when I think of her, I would like to become famous to impress her. Robert began calling the production office of my sister, Sam, asking to speak to Rebecca, but his efforts fell flat. So, in early June 1987, Robert took a plane from his home state of Arizona to California with the intention to see her. He showed up at the studio where the show was filmed with a giant teddy bear and flowers, and he asked to see Rebecca. Security turned him away, and Robert, confused and angry, took a bus back to Arizona. My Sister Sam was canceled in 1988, but Rebecca Schaefer's star was on the rise. She appeared in several movies, including the 1989 comedy Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills, in which she played the daughter of a recently widowed sitcom queen. In the film, she had an intimate scene with her male co-star, This infuriated Robert, who believed she was no longer the sweet, innocent girl that he loved. Robert decided he needed to speak with her, so he paid a private investigator $250 to find out where Rebecca lived. The investigator then paid $10 to the Department of Motor Vehicles and got the actress's home address in Los Angeles. Robert tried to buy a gun, but the gun shop owner would not sell it to him because he believed the man seeking a gun was mentally ill. So, Robert asked his brother to buy him a gun. He claimed it was for target practice. Now, armed with Rebecca's address and a gun, he did one more thing before heading back to Los Angeles from Tucson. He wrote a letter to his sister in Tennessee stating that, quote, I have an obsession with the unobtainable and I have to eliminate something that I cannot obtain. Then he got on a bus heading west. At 6 a.m. on July 18, 1989, Robert walked up and down Rebecca's street, showing his autographed picture of her to anyone he passed. Although he knew her address, he questioned anyone who walked past him if they had seen her. Meanwhile, Rebecca was getting ready for the audition of a lifetime. She had a meeting with director Francis Ford Coppola were the role of the daughter in The Godfather, Part 3. The script was to be delivered that morning, and the audition was that same afternoon. The intercom at her building was broken, so she was listening for the door. At 9 a.m., Robert rang the buzzer for her apartment, and Rebecca came to the door. Thinking Robert was the messenger with the script, she opened the door. Finally, Robert was face to face with the object of his obsession. He showed her the picture she had sent him and they had a brief conversation. She then shook his hand and told him to please take care. He left. 
Robert went to a restaurant nearby, but then realized he forgot to give her a letter and a CD that he made. He decided that he needed to go back one more time. He rang her buzzer and once again saw her walking down the stairs. He stood to the side so she could not see him before opening the door. When Rebecca opened it, Robert jumped out, except this time she did not seem happy to see him, and that did not sit right with him. Robert pulled out his gun from behind his back and shot her two times directly in the chest with hollow point bullets, which are especially lethal. Rebecca screamed, why, why, and fell to the ground. Neighbors ran to her aid, but she was dead by the time she reached the hospital. Robert fled back to Tucson. The next day, he ran up and down a highway ramp in Arizona, screaming that he killed Schaefer. When he was arrested, police found a photo of Rebecca Schaefer in his pocket. He told police, quote, I thought I owed it to Rebecca to kill myself after what happened. Nothing just happened. What happened was that he killed a young woman. What happened was that he took away her future. And as a result, his as well, as he would spend the rest of his life in prison. Robert John Bardo was born January 2nd, 1970. The youngest of seven children, he and his family moved frequently during his childhood due to his father's job in the United States Air Force. His parents met while his father was stationed in Japan, where his mother, who was Korean, lived. His father struggled with alcoholism, and his mother spoke very little English. Reportedly, they fought constantly. Young Robert had dreams of being a musician. Never mind that he didn't sing or play an instrument. He just wanted to be famous. In 1982, when he was 12, the family moved to Arizona. His sister believed the move triggered the deterioration of Robert's mental health. It is true that a severe stressor such as relocation, especially in an adolescent, can be very difficult and therefore can precipitate mental or emotional problems, but not to the degree that Robert suffered. An underlying disease process of mental illness was already developing and certainly would have surfaced, notwithstanding a move to a new geographic area. His father, however, believed Robert began to change the following year, after he visited his sister in Florida, where she was working as a topless dancer. There is no known event that happened during the trip. His father just stated that when he returned home, Robert was markedly different. Either way, by the age of 13, Robert's behavior was odd. In 1982, he developed an obsession with a young girl who lived in Maine. The girl, Samantha Smith, was 10 years old when she received national attention thanks to a letter she wrote to Yuri Andropov, who was the head of the Soviet Union. Terrified by the hysteria of the Cold War between the United States and Russia, she asked Andropov whether he intended to start a war. Andropov replied to her letter and invited her to visit the Soviet Union, which she did. The trip made Samantha a celebrity in both countries, 
and she was named a goodwill ambassador. She wrote a book, traveled the world, and appeared on several TV shows. Robert Bardo became fixated on Samantha and wrote her multiple letters. After she replied to one of them, he believed, as he would do with Rebecca years later, that he had a special relationship with her. So, in December 1983, he stole $140 out of his mother's purse and got on a bus from Arizona, bound for Maine, in search of her. Without money for food, he was starving by the time he got across the country. In Maine, he found a police officer and asked him to bring him to the town where Samantha lived. The police there immediately called the police in Arizona, where a missing person report had been filed. Robert was placed in a temporary home while the police arranged for him to get back to Arizona. While there, he stuck a sharp object. Reports have said a knife. Well, Robert himself said it was a pen, into a vein in an attempt to kill himself. In my 10 years in psychiatric nursing, I occasionally work with adolescents. I can tell you that for a 13-year-old to seek out the target of an obsession, travel across the country, and end up starving due to a lack of funds and planning... And when he fails to accomplish his goal, he tries to kill himself? In the world of adolescent psychiatry, that is a five-alarm fire. Without question, he should have been hospitalized where he could be properly evaluated and treated. But like I've said so many times before on Killer Psyche, that did not happen. He returned home determined to forget about Samantha. Once there, he mailed her all the news clippings he had saved, except for the postcard she sent him. So the first thing that comes to mind for me regarding that is why wasn't he being monitored closely after such an horrific event in Maine? He then moved his obsessive attention to someone new, a teacher in his gifted program at school. He wrote multiple letters to her, expressing how he found her attractive and telling her she was the only person who was nice to him. This is not surprising at all. Robert's inherent mental disorder was obsessing about females. Very few mental disorders such as obsessional stalking, clear up and go away forever. After he told her she should wear her hair a certain way and asked for her home phone number, she became worried and referred him to a school counselor. He did not stop writing to her. Instead, he wrote both the teacher and the counselor lengthy letters. The tone of Robert's letters changed after the teacher reportedly made a comment about his brother having a mental illness. He became very distressed at the idea that she thought the same of him. This sent Robert spiraling, and he believed one of them, either the teacher or himself, needed to die to correct this. Robert would prefer to actually kill someone or himself than have them think ill of him, which in and of itself is very significant evidence of a deeply disturbed individual in need of psychiatric intervention. If all of that sounds strange to you, well, to Robert Bardo and others like him, it makes absolute sense. Robert also threatened another student and compared himself to John Hinckley Jr., the man who attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan in 1981. His behavior at school was a recurring problem. 
he was erratic and angry. He told his school counselor he was having obsessive thoughts of killing someone. At the age of 13, he also told the counselor that his family treated him like the family cat. They would only pay attention to him at feeding time, but otherwise, they ignored him. He might have had a point. After his threats of violence, the school reached out to Robert's parents. Both of them refused to accept that there were any problems with their son. Because of this, in February of 1984, the school had him tested by a psychologist who diagnosed him as having schizoid tendencies. She sent home an evaluation form for his parents to fill out their observations of Robert's behavior and a family history. Instead, Robert filled it out himself and stated, quote, help, this house is hell. I'm going to run away again. I can't stand it. Please help, fast. Living in this house is like living in hell. This is the most blatant cry for help I've ever seen. And it shows a pattern for how his parents dealt with Robert, not only emotionally, but physically as well. The school nurse remarked that she had previously sent earlier notes to his parents in sixth and seventh grade, telling them Robert needed glasses. His parents ignored the notes both times. Instead, they insisted that the school stop meeting with Robert and stop counseling him altogether. Robert was depressed. During the trial for the murder of Rebecca Schaefer, Dr. Park Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist who examined Robert, spoke about the letters he was writing during his time at school. He summarized that the voluminous writings contain, quote, a wide range of powerful emotions that include great rage, sadness, loneliness, anxiety, and despair. He often wrote about feeling suicidal and homicidal. He wrote about experiences he was having and did not understand, such as being unable to sleep or sleeping too much, being unable to concentrate or being distracted by noise. He found it intolerable that the baby was crying or a neighbor was loud. He complained of feeling worthless, ugly, stupid, as well as feeling poor and how he envied others. At other times, he described himself as happy and denied having those other feelings. This is not bipolar, though it does seem that way on the surface. Schizophrenic thinking can appear moody, but it's more likely a result of their disordered thought process. It also could be that he said he felt great and had no problems because that's what he wanted to think about himself. The school advised that the psychologist also determine Robert be classified educationally as well as emotionally handicapped and believed he should be in a residential treatment facility. Due to Robert's threats and pleas for help, his father and the school counselor placed him in a psychiatric hospital on an emergency hold, meaning an involuntary admission. The psychiatrist treating him there stated he had auditory hallucinations, that means he was hearing voices, and obsessive thinking. Robert claimed he always had these hallucinations. He also blamed his mother for ignoring him and said his older brother beat and abused him and controlled every move he made. The control included accusations like making him shoplift and drink urine. I know that sounds repulsive, and you may think Robert is making that up. 
But as a psych nurse, I've had a patient or two who told me the same thing happened to them when they were a young boy from an older brother. And they ended up in psychiatric care. A doctor there diagnosed him with dysthymic depressive disorder. That is a relatively mild but very long-term form of depression and also diagnosed him with obsessive compulsive disorder. That was in regards to his constant thinking about killing others and also himself. OCD, however, is not mood related. It is constant. Fortunately for people that do suffer from this disorder, OCD symptoms do respond well to a family of antidepressants known as SSRIs. It's not a cure, it's a treatment. Robert spent a week in the hospital before his mother checked him out against the medical advice of his doctors. She stated that there was nothing wrong with her son and she refused all services. A social worker wrote that Robert was, quote, a time bomb waiting to explode. Yeah, no kidding. I'd like to find that person and pin a medal on them for their astute observation. It's just too bad no one listened to them. Though Robert was a straight-A student, he was known to be very socially awkward. He would stand alone on a sidewalk during lunch and did not speak or interact in any way with anyone. Oddly, although he had trouble communicating, according to his teachers, he wrote beautifully. In the spring of 1984, Robert was absent from school for three days, and during that time, one of his teachers received a letter that she deemed a suicide note. She gave it to the school counselor, who was also quite alarmed, and had Robert removed from his home and placed in foster care. Finally. Unfortunately, while there, he frequently ran away back to his parents' house. His brother Jeff, not the brother he claimed abused him, hit Robert over the head with a metal pipe. As a result, Jeff was hospitalized and eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia. Could Robert's life get any worse? Yes, it could, and it did. In May of 1985, Robert was once again placed in the foster home due to his parents' refusal to get him the psychological help he needed. Soon after that, he dropped out of school. He was in ninth grade and was only 15 years old. The following month, he was hospitalized again, where he remained for several weeks. He had not only threatened suicide, but also that he wanted to kill his two nieces. At that time, he was given a diagnosis of schizophreniform disorder. Schizophreniform disorder is a short-term psychotic disorder, and it's diagnosed when symptoms of schizophrenia are manifested for at least one month, but for less than six months. If symptoms persist longer than that, the diagnosis is changed to schizophrenia or in some cases, schizoaffective disorders. Someone with this disorder cannot differentiate between what is real and what is imagined. It affects their thought process, their behavior, emotional expression, and interpersonal relationships. In other words, it permeates in a very profound way pretty much every aspect of their life. I think it's important to note that to meet the criteria for schizophreniform disorder, the symptoms are not the result of medications 
or recreational drugs or other medical or mental problems. It is endogenous. That means it comes from within. Robert believed he was being followed by cars and he had auditory hallucinations. He claimed he heard voices from God and Satan, each of them giving him contradictory instructions on how to behave. The voices in his head also told him to hurt others and run away from his foster home. This type of auditory hallucination is called a command hallucination. Do this. Do that. Load your gun. He told doctors that the hallucinations did not bother him. They were just distracting. We know he had been having disturbing thoughts at least since the age of 13 when he imagined that Samantha Smith, the object of his first obsession, was perhaps made up by the government. Once put on medication, it was noticed that after about a month, he was a different person. He was described as a, quote, model patient, complying with everything the doctors asked of him. But that's what antipsychotic medications do. They quell the voices in the patient's head and the delusions that have a stranglehold on their thoughts, their feelings, and behavior. After leaving the hospital, he obtained his GED and got a job at a fast food restaurant as a janitor. It was during this time period that while watching TV, he first saw the young actress Rebecca Schaefer on a commercial for her sitcom, My Sister Sam. He instantly became fascinated with her And that was when he wrote her over 40 letters. It's safe to say he was probably off his medication. She did respond to his letters one time. And after that, he did not receive any more. Dr. Park Dietz believed that Robert's affections were, quote, drawn to those he sees as non-threatening and accepting. Certainly, Rebecca Schaefer fit that description. According to the press at the time, she was the embodiment of the girl next door. Rebecca was not the only young female celebrity to garner Bardo's interest then. He was also infatuated with the popular 80s singer Debbie Gibson. He even traveled to New York to see her, first visiting the famed apartment building, the Dakota, to see where John Lennon was shot to death in 1980. He described his interest in Gibson as fleeting, and after he was unable to find where she lived, he gave up on her. Now he turned his focus solely on Rebecca Schaefer. Carrying a teddy bear and flowers, he went to Los Angeles and tried to visit her on the studio lot where she was filming her TV series. He was turned away by security and went back to Arizona. After Rebecca appeared in a film where her character had an intimate scene with her love interest, Robert, thinking it was real, was heartbroken and furious. This was not the Rebecca he knew, and with whom he had a special relationship. In his eyes, she was now tainted. He told his father he was going to L.A. to see Rebecca Schaefer. His father reportedly asked him if he was going to be like John Hinckley Jr. Robert told him no, but according to Robert, He thought his dad was asking if he was going to shoot the president. Robert was, however, determined to follow in the footsteps of another man, John Lennon's murderer, Mark David Chapman, whom he felt he understood. Chapman stalked his prey and punished the famous man for disappointing him. And that was what Robert intended to do to Rebecca. 
he was not only going to punish her, but like Chapman, he was motivated to save her from herself. And that is what led him to stalking her. Stalking is the term given to repeated, unwanted, and intrusive behavior towards another person, and it creates distress. Stalking can include correspondence in all its varied forms or outright approaches. In about half of these cases, the stalking is short-lived, lasting only a couple of weeks or, more realistically, only a few days. According to the Cambridge Press, for the other half, it is very likely to last much longer, many months, pursuing a course of conduct that amounts to harassment or stalking and constitutes a criminal violation in most jurisdictions. Celebrities and public figures, because of their high profile and because their role requires them to court public affection and attention, they are at particular risk of being stalked. On the very rare occasions when a public figure has been attacked, stalking behavior has generally been a prelude. So what causes it? Severe mental illness, particularly psychosis, such as we've been talking about with Robert Bardo, is often an important driver of stalking behavior. Prominent figures are frequently subjected to unwanted and intrusive attentions. And like I said, such stalking cases is often driven by psychotic illness, meaning the person is out of touch with reality. For example, Bardo thought Rebecca Schaefer loved him. Sometimes people that stalk celebrities and are schizophrenic, they blame the public figure for their delusional persecution. Now, sometimes it's a different mental illness. It's erotomania. Eros was the Greek god of love. The stalking behavior associated with erotomaniac delusions is intimacy-seeking. And that is what Robert Bardo was suffering from when he killed Rebecca Schaefer. Another famous celebrity, Madonna, had a very, very violent stalker who suffered from erotomania. His name is Robert Dewey. Her personal bodyguard actually got into hand-to-hand combat with Dewey when he trespassed on her property looking for her. Her bodyguard said to him, who are you and what are you doing here? And he responded, what are you doing here? She's my wife. And he truly believed that he was married to her. The clinical definition of erotomania, it is a delusion, an intense belief that has no basis in fact, and the individual believes it despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And with the erotomaniac, they believe another person, typically of higher social status, is in love with them. This disorder is very rare, thankfully. And here's kind of a scary thing, as if the rest isn't scary enough. It's not unusual for erotomaniacs to think that the person they love is sending them secret messages and they believe this with absolutely no proof at all. For example, they may be walking down a street, hear a bird chirp in a tree, and think that is their love, telling them they love and want them. Without question, people suffering from erotomania can very definitely pose a threat to their target. The target may be killed. Why? Their admirer believes they've been rejected. And that is what happened to Rebecca Schaefer. Robert Bardo thought she rejected him for the man she had an intimate scene with in a movie. 
And just to put a fine point on it, a perpetrator of this type has usually had a history of stalking behavior and of severe mental illness. And Robert Bardo had both of those traits. Robert Bardo's public defender in Arizona tried to prevent his extradition to Los Angeles based on lack of mental competency. Unfortunately for Robert, his attorney filed the motion in the wrong court. Los Angeles authorities capitalized on the mistake and quickly extradited Bardo to Los Angeles. Robert was held in the mental ward of the L.A. County Jail. His Los Angeles public defender, Stephen Galindo, refused to enter a plea of insanity or not guilty as a protest of what he called Robert's illegal extradition. Because of this, more than a year passed before Robert received a court-ordered mental evaluation. The deputy district attorney at the time... Marsha Clark, agreed to remove the death penalty in exchange for Bardo waiving his right to a trial by jury. A bench trial was set for October 1991. Days before the trial, Dr. Park Dietz, the forensic psychiatrist I quoted earlier, who is an expert on celebrity stalkers, interviewed Robert Bardo in the L.A. County Jail. When Marsha Clark reviewed the videotape session, she noticed an important detail as Robert reenacted the shooting for Dr. Dietz. Robert made the gesture of removing his gun, which he had hidden behind his back in the waistband of his pants. For Clark, this proved that he hid the weapon so that Schaefer would not know his true intentions when she approached him at the doorway of her apartment. Also, there were no words exchanged between Robert and Rebecca before he shot her. Clark would use these actions to bolster a case of premeditated murder and, more importantly, lying in wait, which is a special circumstance. Premeditation meant he would be guilty of first-degree murder with a penalty of prison for the rest of his life. Proving the special circumstances of lying in wait charges would ensure Bardo would never receive parole. During the three weeks of testimony, Bardo kept his head down and remained silent. But there was one moment of exception. Bardo's attorney played the U2 song Exit which was written about gun violence in response to the novel In Cold Blood. Lyrics in the song were meant to reflect the mind of a serial killer. While the song played, Bardo became animated, singing along to it and mouthing the lyrics, pistol weighing heavily. Dr. Dietz said that Robert Bardo had interpreted parts of the song as references to himself and Schaefer. Robert's lawyer maintained that the song Exit gave him the idea for his mission and that it was partly to blame for Rebecca Schaefer's murder. Well, defense attorneys have to say something, don't they? While Robert's attorney repeatedly tried to focus on his mental state at the time of the killing, Marsha Clark emphasized that Bardo was in control of his actions and shot Rebecca Schaefer while lying in wait. On October 29th, Robert Bardo was found guilty of first-degree murder and the special circumstances of lying in wait. In December 1991, he was sentenced to life without parole and sent to the California State Prison for the Criminally Insane 
in Vacaville, California. While Rebecca Schaefer's death is tragic, some good did come from it. The LAPD created the first ever threat management unit to deal with stalkers. And other police departments across the country soon followed this model. Also in 1990, California passed a law restricting the Department of Motor Vehicles from releasing individuals' home addresses. And four years later, the rest of the country followed suit. The nation's first stalking law, Penal Code 646.9, was a reaction to Teresa Saldana's stabbing and Rebecca Schaefer's murder. And in 1996, Congress passed an anti-stalking law as part of the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, to address interstate stalking. Although this does not lessen the tragedy of Rebecca Schaefer's murder, today all 50 states, the District of Columbia and United States territories, have enacted criminal laws to address stalking. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Ann Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Wondery.